The Lord be with you. Grace and peace to everyone in the name of Jesus Christ. We welcome you here this morning to Broadway Baptist Church. Uh, so glad to be gathered here in the house of uh, the Lord, both here at uh, this sanctuary in Fort Worth and then also in all of the sanctuary of the earth to which, uh, or from which, uh, that you may be joining us this morning. We welcome you all. If you're visiting with us today, my name is Ryan Price, and I'm the senior pastor here at Broadway, and we are so glad to have you with us. We like to say we are a church of extraordinary worship and extravagant hospitality, and we pray that you will find both of those things with us as we come this morning to worship God uh, together. If you are visiting with us, I'll, I'll make note that inside of the order of worship, there is a, a, something called the life of the church, which you can utilize to access some more information about our congregation. And we just simply warmly welcome you to this day. Uh, I invite in the spirit of extravagant hospitality for us all to take a moment to stand, to greet one another with signs and words of Christ's peace. And if you're visiting among us uh, online or just joining us online, say hi from wherever it is that you're joining in. Peace be with you. We're grateful today. It's uh, uh, something of a unique service for us this morning. One, our youth, which are usually to my left here, are actually joining with our chancel choir this morning in the leadership of worship. So we're looking forward to that. And then also today you will note on the cover of our worship guide, it says Stephen Ministry, and we are focusing uh, the leadership of this service with our Stephen ministers. Our Stephen ministry is a care ministry you'll hear more about in um, the service itself, but it is the way in which uh, we organize to give care to one another in this community of faith, and it is an important resource for our pastors and other leaders within our congregation uh, to help stay connected and to give that very special care that sometimes uh, in the course of life we all need. So we are very grateful for our Stephen ministers and look forward to their leadership in worship this morning. As we come then for this hour of worship of God together, I say unto you, lift up your hearts.
Please join me in the hearts of worship. We all long for heaven where God is. Being happy with God now means loving as he loves, helping as he helps, giving as he gives, serving as he serves, rescuing as he rescues, being with him 24 hours, touching him in his distressing Let us pray. Dear God, today we come to worship you and to learn how to care for those around us. The needs are great and varied, but we must first care for each other in our local circles so that we have the strength and the support to reach out to others that also need our care. Today, we are particularly recognizing Stephen Ministry, an international organization that trains volunteers to provide distinctively Christian care 
in a one-on-one -on -one relationship. him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you all can see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. I would, I would like to share with you a little bit about what Stephen Ministry is. It may be a new idea to some of you. Stephen Ministry is a ministry of distinctly Christian caregiving. It is a ministry of caring for others. Stephen ministers are dedicated to helping others travel through difficult times in their life. If someone is going through a life transition, a crisis, a loss, or just needs someone to talk to, Stephen ministers are available to give emotional and spiritual support. <clears throat> Having begun in 1975, Stephen Ministry is now in all 50 states, serving more than 12,000 church congregations. The ministry also reaches 10 Canadian provinces and 29 other countries. It has helped more than 1.5 million people. I am one of those people, having had the help of a wonderful Stephen ministry when my daughter passed away several years ago. There are a number of other Stephen ministry churches in Tarrant County, and Broadway is a member of the Tarrant County Stephen Ministry Network. At Broadway, we have trained approximately 30 Stephen uh, ministers. <clears throat> Caregiver is the name we give to, give to Stephen ministers, in addition to Stephen minister. To become a Stephen minister, applicants must complete 50 hours of training. So it is a true calling for those who decide to become caregivers. The training includes listening skills, confidentiality, feelings, relationship building, empathy, interventions, dealing with a crisis, information about other available resources, and the use of prayer and scripture. Typically, the Stephen minister and the care receiver meet for about an hour a week at a time and place that is convenient for both. Stephen ministers also commit to one to two hours a month for supervision. This is a time that Stephen ministers, with the help of a trained Stephen leader, can get support and prayer from each other. 
It is always confidential in that the ministers never share the names or identifying information of their care receiver with other Stephen ministers or anyone else for that matter. I want to emphasize that all information about a care receiver is held in the strictest confidence by the caregiver. It's not shared with family members or friends or anyone else, even to the point of not telling anyone that their care receiver is participating in the program. Only the care receiver can disclose this if and when they so choose. People request Stephen ministers for a variety of reasons. They may need someone to talk to may be struggling with their faith, may be feeling discouraged, anxious, or lonely. Perhaps they're coping with divorce or grieving a loss, maybe of a loved one, a job, a relationship, or health. They may be making a transition in life, dealing with dying, have a terminally ill family member, or be having financial difficulties. Stephen ministers are very caring individuals ready to meet the needs of others in a confidential manner. They are ready to talk with those who need someone to listen for any reason. While not professional counselors, their training qualifies them to be good supportive listeners and helpers, always looking to God in the support that they offer. <clears throat> Please pray for this group. God commands us to share each other's burdens, and this is what Stephen ministry does. We are to encourage one another, and it is a reminder to us that we are all broken, and only through Christ are we made whole. If you or someone you know would benefit from having a Stephen minister, please contact one of our pastoral staff members. The Gospel Lesson from Luke. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified, and they thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. 
See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. Then he said this to them. He showed them his hands and feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning with Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the gospel of grace. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. God of light and darkness, how grateful we are for your loving mercies. You see our fear and our doubt, our suspicion, our mistrust, and you banish them from our lives, replacing them with hope and peace and love and joy. You call us to be your witnesses to all the world, unafraid of what others might think or say about us. We have been invited out of our darkened hideaways into the light of your world as ambassadors of hope and justice, peace and compassion. Be with us as we participate in ministries of healing and hope through this church, in our community, and in your world. Give us courage and strength to be your disciples in all circumstances of our lives. God, this morning we give thanks to those who have been called out as Stephen ministers, women and men who give of themselves and are ready to meet the needs of others in a confidential manner. We pray for the ministry of our Stephen ministers. Give them ears to listen and hearts to care. God, you command us to bear one another's burdens and to encourage one another. Thank you for these folks who have answered your call. Be with us and in us this week. Help us to be your witness in our world. Amen.
Amen. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree, St. Peter said, to the council that was persecuting him and others in the early church in the book of Acts. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so too is the Holy Spirit. We are witnesses. We have seen some things. We've seen suffering and struggle and dying and death. And we have also seen resurrection. The disciples were all still gathered together in a safe house in Jerusalem when after his resurrection, Jesus came and stood among them. This is one of my favorite scenes in all of the Bible. You read it and you see it's almost, in my imagination, comical. The disciples cannot believe their eyes and they think that they are seeing a ghost. Meanwhile, Jesus is asking them if they've got any fish for him to eat. And not just fish, but broiled fish, the Bible says, because the man knows what he likes. And there is nothing like a little broiled tilapia to eat after three days in the tomb. Tilapia, by the way, is what Jesus is said to have grilled up for Peter on the banks of the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> and it is still called St. Peter's fish in Israel even to this very day. For more useless tidbits, feel free to come back next Sunday. <laughs> Jesus eats with his disciples and he shows them his hands and his feet. And they see the places in his hands and his feet where the nails had been. They see his scars and they begin to understand that this is no ghost. Then Jesus begins to do a little Bible study with the disciples. He shows them in the scriptures how the Messiah was to suffer and rise from the dead and tells them that the opportunity for repentance and forgiveness is to be offered to all nations in his name. And he tells them then that they, the disciples, are to be his witnesses. You are witnesses to these things. You are here to bear witness. That is what our guide Alma Ruth with the organization Practice Mercy told us last week when we went down to our southern border with our ecumenical partner Fellowship Southwest to see what all of the asylum seekers on the other side are having to 
endure. See the suffering, see the struggle, go back and bear witness, Alma Ruth told us. We toured the Rio Grande via a riverboat. We saw the wall. A bunch of MAGA people who had come to see an invasion also came down. We did not see an invasion. We did see a few turtles. And we saw a few rafts left behind by desperate people trying to make it across the river so they could turn themselves in and enter the asylum seeking process here in the States. Later that day, we toured a refugee camp in Reynosa, Mexico. There were a thousand plus asylum seekers from Haiti and Honduras and Venezuela and other Central and South American countries. They are all there waiting for their asylum appointments with our government. Later, we visited another encampment where Russians and Belarusians and Ukrainians were gathered at a border checkpoint called Progresso near McAllen. The men there are all fleeing the war in Ukraine and the repression in Russia. Many are ethnic minorities, easy conscripts for cannon fodder on the front lines of Mr. Putin's war. It is not an invasion, not on our border. It is an escape. They are escaping war and violence and conscription and oppression and organized crime and rape. I bear witness to their suffering. I bear witness to the journey of two sisters and a child of profound physical and mental disability who walked through the jungle of the Darien Gap in a months long journey, just trying to make it to safety in Los Estados Unidos. They say, however, that the worst is not the jungle, but the buses and then the border in Mexico. There they are prey to cartels. They are subject to shakedowns. They fear being kidnapped and extorted at any point on the journey. The wolves there guard the sheep. I bear witness. And I plead with us as a congregation not to see them as a force of invasion but as brothers and sisters in Christ and beloved kindred in our common humanity who need better and safer legal pathways to make it across our border. They are bottlenecked there stuck in a dangerous place, waiting in safe houses, just like the disciples. And it is so, it is so frankly, because some in our own government want to make it so. 
They wish to create a crisis to make it look like an invasion. I bear witness. And I ask that we do what Jesus told the disciples to do and St. Peter and the other apostles did to bear witness and to plea for our nation to repent and find forgiveness, to repent of its policies, which are a kind of another wall, and to find forgiveness for its callousness. We are a Christian people And this means that we believe in a God who came to us in the form of a human being. He too was a refuge, a refugee, let us remember. He too had to flee from violence in his own homeland. He too suffered, he too struggled, He too was human. And the prophet Isaiah says he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with all of our griefs. This is why Jesus and faith in Jesus is so real on the border. Because he is real anywhere there is suffering, anywhere there is struggle, anywhere there are refugees. People see his scars and and they know that he has known their sorrows. They know that he is, in the words of Henry Nouwen, a wounded healer, and that by his stripes they are healed. Isn't this always the case anywhere there is suffering or there is grief? Isn't it the case with Stephen ministry which we are remembering and thinking of this morning? Stephen in the Bible suffered, he was persecuted, he was killed, yet there was life and there was love in his spirit and there was forgiveness in his heart and by his wounds the whole community found its healing. We trust our wounded healers. They are not ghosts, they've been through something in body and in soul and they have lived to tell about it and they are our guides from suffering to restoration, brokenness to being made whole. This is the reason why scripture goes to such great lengths to show us Jesus' body. Because some said that the Messiah could never suffer. They said Jesus only appeared to suffer. No. No. The wounds were real. And they bear witness that the Messiah has been through something. They testify that he too, just like us, like all humans, suffered and endured. This is why Dietrich Bonhoeffer from the depths of a Nazi prison camp said, only a suffering God can help us. Because only someone who has borne our wounds 
can help us to bind them up also. Inside today's order of worship, there is a picture of a man named Father Michael Lapsley, a longtime hero to me. I have spoken of him before. He is a luminary in South Africa, and he will be here to preach in this pulpit at Broadway on April 28th. Father Lapsley was a clergyman turned freedom fighter against apartheid in South Africa. He was exiled from the country and escaped to Lesotho where someone within the South African government sent a letter bomb which tore into his body, taking both of his hands and one of his eyes. After apartheid, Father Lapsley became a major, major voice and witness for reconciliation and for forgiveness in the country, founding the Center for the Healing of Memories. And in his memoir, which some of our Sunday school classes will be reading in May, in which De uh, Desmond Tutu wrote the foreword for, Father Lapsley says these words, which I think are apt for us to consider any time we think about our connection with others' wounds. My visible brokenness creates a bond with others whose brokenness is often less visible than, than mine, but just as real. The truth is that pain unites human beings. In my work as a healer, many people say they can trust me because I know pain. And in the end, what matters most is whether we are able to transform pain into a life-giving force. By Christ's stripes, we were made healed. We trust Christ because he knew pain. We believe him because he too was a refugee, someone who suffered, someone who had scars, someone who had been through something. We trust him because he was a wounded healer. And his wounds bear witness to our own pain, visible and also invisible. And we trust him when he says, Beloved, healing is possible. Restoration is possible. Forgiveness and repentance and reconciliation with others with whom we've been at enmity, those who have inflicted grave, grave violence upon us is possible. He has known our pain and he was acquainted with all of our suffering and our iniquity and he was wounded for this world's transgressions 
and yet he was made whole. And we, we and this wounded, wounded world, we have a chance to be made whole also. This is what it means that he appeared to them, showing them his hands and his feet, his scars and his wounds. There's an old bluegrass song. I don't usually quote bluegrass up here on Sunday mornings. But there's one that I love that says this. By the mark where the nails have been. By the sign upon his precious skin. I will know my Savior when I come to him. By the mark where the nails have been. By the mark where the nails have been, we know that he suffered. And by his scars, we know that he was healed. And to these marks, we bear witness. And by these marks, we are witness too. Also, we are witnesses to his struggle and to his suffering and to his humanity and his death. And also, thank God, his resurrection. And so too is the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all, and together all of God's people say, Come, see, touch, know that it is I and not a ghost, Jesus says. To Thomas, he says, put your hands here and here. Know that I know pain also. Know that I know what it means to be wounded in body and in spirit. Know what it means to see that you can be healed in the goodness of God's redemption and resurrection. The invitation comes this morning. Come and be close to this man who was acquainted with all our pain and our griefs. Come, touch the Savior.
our Christ. Pray with me. Dear Lord, we come here today with gratitude in our hearts. We are grateful for your wonderful creation and for giving us a place within that creation. We are grateful for the chance to worship freely, grateful for your abundant love and mercy, and grateful for the opportunity to share of our abundance. Guide us as we seek to make the best use of that which we bring to share. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
Wonderful opportunity for me to welcome into this community of faith Aaron Ogle, who comes making a profession of faith this morning with the intention of being baptized. Uh, already has a baptismal date set, so I like a person with an agenda. I like this. This is good. Uh, we are looking for June 16th, and I am delighted in this occasion. He stands today with uh, his father, Keith is standing with him as a kind of witness together, and we give thanks for it. I uh, love it when a young person makes a decision to follow in the way of Jesus and to come and give their life, as we were talking about a moment ago, as a witness to God. And my deep prayer for you is that the spirit that was the same spirit that was in Jesus Christ will also be in you and will come and give you wisdom and power, love, goodness, and that you will walk forth as uh, a bold witness for God in Christ, Christ in God in, in you in this world. So uh, I'm delighted in this day, and I know that we look forward to this baptism. Would you join me, congregation, as we say together our affirmation of responses, which are printed in the order of service. We joyfully welcome you into this community of grace, and we offer you our love and friendship. We promise to be your family as we worship and serve our God together. The right hand of fellowship to you, Aaron. God bless you, and God, I know that your grandparents, are they here today? Dad is. There, Melvin's back there, and I bet your, your grandma's uh, watching. watching right now from home. So we're excited for this and give thanks from generation unto generation for you all. And we say God bless you. Go ahead and have a, have a seat. And I know that the congregation at the conclusion of our worship um, will want to come and give welcome. As we conclude day, today, just a couple of things I want to make note of. There is an organ recital opportunity today at 4 o'clock p.m. with various students from various schools in the area. So uh, that is an exciting opportunity for us. And then in a couple of weeks, we have our LOL fundraiser upcoming. Uh, we will want to make a plan to be here for lunch on that day to celebrate our youth who have led us in worship this morning. The, chance, uh, this, the chapel choir, thank you very much for your uh, part in today's service. And our fifth and sixth graders are at our sister church in Dallas, Wilshire Baptist Church this morning. So uh, we, they're leading Wilshire in worship. We have a thriving music program here and our youth will be going to New York City this summer on choir tour, and uh, we need a little help to, to you know, get, them, get them there. So uh, let's plan for that. We're so very grateful for all of the many good things that are going on in this church. And then one final thing about our music program, we are in a search for a new chancel choir director. 
with Dr. Michael Cox's retirement. Uh, please note, I've been asked to make the announcement that uh, if you know of someone who may be interested in this position, the job description is on the order, uh, excuse me, uh, on the website, uh, our homepage, right there. Uh, just have to scroll down a little bit, but that will give them all of the information about the job posting and how it is that they can apply. Uh, we look forward to building on uh, what has thus far been done. We have a great, really, truly extraordinary music program and even, even more better things to come. And for all of it, we do give thanks. Depart now, beloved, the Spirit of God and Christ in you. For the world needs your light and your hope and your deep, deep courage. So go, be brave, be strong, be kind, and be love. Always be love. Amen. Amen.